That was Sonambient. This is a Harry Bertoia podcast. Hello, I am Celia Bertoia, and today we're going to be talking about the tonal sounding sculptures, tips and tidbits of tonals. Realize that I probably know more about Bertoia sculptures than most anybody, with the exception of Dr. Marin Sullivan, our catalog resume director. She knows the scholarly aspect of it. But Harry was my father, and we went to the shop frequently, so I got to experience a lot of these things firsthand. So today I'm going to talk about all little odd things that usually get ignored. One thing that Harry would do was occasionally he would make a small tonal, and it was often on the gold-plated small ones. They would be maybe six inches to a foot or so and uh, just thin wires. Uh, sometimes they were set at a diagonal, so there'd be two planes of rods going up at opposite angles. And for some reason, on those types of tonals, sometimes Harry would intentionally skip a few rods. I actually did not talk to him about this when he was alive, but a friend of mine who had one of these tonals said that when he gave it to her, he explained that it was in following of nature's ways, that when you see a tree or a plant, oftentimes there's a, a branch missing or, you know, leaves got eaten by an animal or whatever. So every once in a while he just skipped a few rods and it was just sort of a, a fun little thing that he did. And when auction houses or galleries come upon one of these sculptures with the missing rods, they think it's a mistake or they got broken off or a bad thing. And usually you'll see, I mean sometimes rods do get broken off of course, but on these that have been intentionally made that way, it's different because you can see on the base that there there was no hole there. There was no there wasn't anything that shows the mark of a rod. So it's just one of those interesting little things. Uh, and Harry actually, well, he was not an engineer, but he did study a lot, whether it was uh, in scientific books or books about astronomy. And he did read about sound because obviously he was interested in sound. And I wanted to read some quotes of his. He was talking about sound. One thing was people would ask him if his sound sculptures were re related to the other types of sculptures. Someone asked him if the spill cast sculptures were related to the sounding sculptures. And Harry said, oh, they are related. Yeah. He always said, yeah, kind of like the ba-ba in a sheep. Yeah, yeah. And I think that was from being European. Oh, they are related. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Because sounds that you heard just now are identical with the forms that are seen in the Dulles Airport spill cast. If you photographically were able to capture that emotion, all the information which is a result of high temperatures and forces in the earth would come very close to the sounds that we actually heard. So there is an element manifesting itself in all these various pieces. The fact that you see these tonals so orderly and almost cool in presence is no indication except on the surface. But I go beyond the visible portion of this. I go to the sound, and the sound to me is what I think makes it possible for me to get a little closer to what I want to say. When the sculptures are motionless, that is only the pose. That is only awaiting the moment of action. Yeah, uh, end quote. But then he goes on to talk about the frequency. He touched a tonal, perhaps like this one. He says, we get a very thin sound, and the frequency is almost 90. We touch a different one, we get a different mode of impact. All the differences, the thickness of wire and all that, it can be a very playful affair. End quote there. What I want to get across here is that he knew something about sound. He was not a musician. He never claimed to be a musician, but he did know the, about the vibrations and thought about that. 
So when he was making a tonal sculpture, of course he thought about how it would look visually, but he also thought about the sound. And there was a great deal of experimentation for the, the larger tonal pieces. He had to think about how tall could he go with a certain diameter rod before it would start leaning out. How heavy could the tops be before it would make the rod sway aside? All these things. And, and one thing he did say about tonals, he said, if it looks good, it's going to sound good. And I think what he meant by that is if it looks balanced and beautiful visually, it's going to be balanced and harmonious in an auditory way as well. Now, one thing that is not often talked about either is that his brother, Oresta, who was seven years older than him, was a musician, a self-taught musician, played many instruments, all of the stringed instruments and piano. And, and at the end of his life, he even wrote a short symphony, but he never even heard it played because he didn't have an orchestra to work. But in any case, Oresta, when he first saw the sounding sculptures that Harry was making, this appealed to his musical side. And Harry could tell that he liked them and that it stirred something in him, but it was quite a while before Oresta came back to him and said, you know, I think you should put these in groups to make a whole orchestra out of these tonals. And he, he basically envisioned what ultimately became the sun ambient barn. He said you could have all shapes and sizes, different tops, and so there would be many different sounds and you could play concerts. And Harry always gave credit to Aresta, but that sort of got lost in the, in the translation. I want to give credit to Aresta. The evolution of tonals was rather interesting. Probably most people have heard the story of the origin when Harry was working on a simple wire sculpture. One of the wire rods broke off, pittered through the air making a sound and then hit the floor and made another sound and Harry wondered, oh, if one rod does that, how, how would it sound if there were 10 or 20 or 100? From that point, he began to experiment and actually make some of the original sounding sculptures. The very first ones were constructed upside down. He would make a grid similar to the chairs and then take the rods and hold them from the bottom, weld them to this wire grid. Now as you can imagine it was extremely time consuming and labor intensive. So he soon realized that that wasn't really the best way to go. So then he just took a, a regular old flat brass base like we see today, and he would drill the correct size hole so that the rod could slip in there, maybe a little bit bigger than the rod so he could uh, put the solder. And he almost always used silver solder. If you see other colors of solder, that would certainly give me pause and it should anyone because I don't think I've ever seen a tonal with anything other than silver solder. So he did that for a while, just drilling a hole for the right size of the diameter of the wire. Then the next step, which came in about uh, 1970, was he would not only drill a hole for the rod or wire, but he would also drill out a little divot or dimple, which created a space for the silver solder to pool in. And it became a very neat and tidy affair but it was much stronger. The first iteration of the drilled pieces, the silver solder would kind of splay out and spill out, and it, uh, for lack of a better word, it, it looked kind of sloppy. But when he figured out this divot process, it looked much neater, was also stronger. Okay, then as we are publishing, or soon to publish, the catalog resume, we had to come up with definitions and terms for Brutoya. And because he has such a, a broad oeuvre and it made so many different things, it, there really has to be a, a Brutoya language all its own. So we began to define the different tonals. For one, it was defined by the kind of tops or lack thereof that the tonals have. And this is just audio, so you can't see these, but uh, we call the just the simple straight rods reeds, reed rods, because they resemble a reed out in nature. And they have a soothing 
quiet sound. Then the cattail rods are quite popular and they resemble cattails that you'd see out in the swamps in nature. And nature was a huge influence on Harry Bertoia. I think everyone's familiar with the cattail tonals. Then when you see the very heavy, thicker tops, we decided to call those cylinder tops because that, that's what Harry called them, Cyl cylinder tops. And they have a much more percussive sound and louder and... <laughs> And then there are some tonals that have, we call it a bud top because it's neither of, not a big heavy cylinder, it's not a cattail. It might be a little rounded bud. Um, we don't have any here in the gallery like that on display. I think we have some in the storage. Or sometimes they were kind of a little vertical doodah. Yeah, a rounded bud or uh, a longer bud, either vertically or horizontally. I think, again, he was just experimenting. But as we were talking about before, that some of the, the gill tonals mostly made in the 60s had angles there'd be slight angles to two or three groups so those we called angled makes sense uh, sometimes he did make circular tonals either just a, a nice round uh, border with nothing in the middle and on a round base Sometimes it was a semicircular base. Not too many of those either, so those are rather unusual. And then he made some multi-group tonals, which, as the name indicates, there, there'd be several groups, maybe three or even four different groups, and each group might be a different height or... Uh, there might be one single row and then square of rods over here. Multi-group, those are called. And I want to mention, after reading so many of Harry's letters and his responses to people who would write to him asking questions, one of the main questions was, how do we clean this sculpture? And this really referred to all types of sculptures, not just the tonals. But the tonals have several easy ways to clean them. If they're just dusty, if it's a large tonal and there's a space between the rods, say an inch or whatever, you just take a, a rag and run that through each row to get rid of the dust, just like any normal housekeeping person would do. If there is some kind of sticky coating, maybe somebody spilled juice on it or whatever, Harry would say, just now, Again, this would be for a more robust sculpture. This would not be for a really fragile, delicate wire piece. But for a normal tonal, he said, just take it out in the yard and get the hose going and spray it down. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, people are so shocked. Oh my God, it's an art piece. It's worth so much. And, but no, it's, it's just common sense. And the other question that came to him a lot was, oh, one of the rods got bent. What should I do? Now, again, it depends on the type of rod. If it's a, a good, thick, sturdy rod, you know, say three-eighth inch thick, that is is not going to break unless you really do some major destruction to it. So if it's a, a good thick rod like that, if the rod is bent to the right, you just grab it from the left, bend it, you pull it back. And you, you have to pull it back probably three or four times as far as you hope it will end up. If it's six inches out of whack, you'll probably want to pull it maybe a couple of feet the other direction and maybe it won't be exactly perfect the first time so you just do it a few times until you get it right. I had a small square tonal with oh the rods I think or maybe just an eighth and it was it was a reproduction uh, and I we had loaned it to a museum while they had a Bertoia exhibition and I said try to keep an eye on it but let people touch it and it came back it looked like somebody's hair after they'd been in a convertible for three hours I mean it was just zigzaggy it was horrible I was actually horrified when I saw it, <laughs> but I did that process. If I was watching a movie or something, I'd just do a few rods, and it did take me several days, hours, many hours, but I finally got all the rods 
back in order and they were all nice and orderly like they had been originally. So it, it can be done. Now if you have a small tonal with very thin wires, you will have to be more careful because the thinner the wire is, the more easily, especially if you're uh, making it go back and forth. You know, that's a, a sure recipe to break it right off. If you do have a rod that's actually broken out of its base and you can see it broke on top of the solder, you're not gonna be able to fix that. And you will have to take it to a welder, but you'll have to be really careful because it took Harry many, many years to perfect his techniques. And if you just take it to a farm implement welder, chances are they may you know, go at it with their torch and maybe they're gonna loosen up all the other rods around it and make a, a worse mess than what you started with. So it has to be someone who has experience. So in that case, you may have to take it to a conservator. Now taking any art to a professional conservator is an expensive proposition. But if you have a, a beautiful Bertoia piece and it's damaged beyond your abilities to fix it it's definitely worth it those are just some of the tips and tidbits I can't think of anything else right now do you have any questions I do um, back to the soldering technique that you were talking about what exactly is soldering is that like the melted metal when it's like in its liquid form or is that the act of actually like taking a torch or something attaching okay. it well that's a great question and yeah, sometimes I forget that the, these are metallurgy terms and very few people know what they mean. So soldering requires the lowest temperature of all the attachment techniques. There's soldering, brazing, and welding. And I did take a metallurgy class, but again, I'm not an expert. But to my understanding, soldering, uh, you have you have a a third element. You've got the two pieces that you want to attach and then you have the silver solder or you know it, there are different kinds of solder but in Harry's case the silver solder and it's usually it comes in a, kind of a stick form so you would have the torch and it's it's at a lower temperature and you probably he would have the wires in a jig in a stiff form a framework that's holding them in place so everything's in place and the rods are sitting down into the drilled hole and then he takes that solder holds it in there or, or just cuts off a little piece and, and puts it right at the hole heats that up and it will melt and sink into the hole and brazing which is the next level of temperature is similar to soldering except you have a brazing rod and the brazing rod requires a little higher temperature and it will be a little bit stronger connection once it's done. You can see in many of the wire or copper tubing pieces such as the Philadelphia Civic Center fountain or the cube that we have here in the foundation, many of those were were brazed and he would use I believe a bronze brazing rod which acts as sort of a glue and then it adds texture as well because it's kind of bumpy and lumpy and welding is the highest temperature method of attaching and that's where you heat both metals both the in this case the the rod or you know whatever two two pieces you're working with that you want to attach you heat it to such a high temperature that that part of the metal actually starts to melt so the the two parts melt together and that forms a very strong bond you'll see that in in engineering projects bridges and uh, railroad trussles and things like that because they have to be really strong and each metal has a different melting temperature uh, and it ranges from about uh, maybe 800 well some of them I think are even down as low as 400 degrees Fahrenheit all the way up to, to 2000 Fahrenheit and again I, I probably should be careful with these numbers because I'm not an expert. Yeah, welding is very difficult because you're dealing with these high temperatures. You know, the the flame of the torch is so hot and so bright that you have to wear welder's glasses to protect eyes from the brightness. And you really should have a whole mask on because if anything spits out at you, it's going to burn you 
badly. Interesting. Because I didn't know that that was, in my mind, I was picturing Harry with, like, a piece of silver that he heated up in, like, a smelting and then put it in like this little spoon and mm. was able to just let it pool and not divot mm-hmm. but i didn't know that that was like there was three different terms and temperatures that's interesting yeah and harry always used an oxyacetylene torch which could get very hot uh he he'd have the torch i think they're still at the shop in valley to this day uh, he'd have a big tank of oxygen a big tank of acetylene fed into the torch and that's what lit the torch with a flame and it lit up the gases and those gases uh, flame at a very high temperature and blue flame it was one color if it was yellow another so he, he had that all down. Uh, and one of the things he liked to do with the torch, at the shop he would smoke a pipe, a wooden pipe, and he liked this kind of cherry-flavored tobacco. I can still smell it. And he lit his pipe with his torch. <laughs> he has this high-temperature torch, and he, he just put it down to his pipe and puff on it. And so his pipes burned down to a crisp after about six months. When he bought pipes, he would buy six of them at a time because he knew they were going to burn down. <laughs> so he was a, kind of a character that way. He, in the photos that I've seen, and then the pipe, he seemed very comfortable working with these potentially very dangerous tools. Yeah, he sure was. And he was such a strong man, physically strong and mentally strong too but uh yeah he was so strong there were times where he had these two brothers working for him ed and jim flanagan and they were great oh, they, but one time he instructed them to move this asbestos platform over about five feet because it was not in quite the right place for what harry needed to do and the two brothers they were both pretty muscular pretty husky guys well ed was husky jim was more wiry he gave them that job and they simply couldn't do it for as strong as they were they just couldn't move this platform and they they even had ropes hooked up and oh they just tried for half an hour and they just couldn't do it and finally harry was kind of annoyed and he just goes over there and they had this big rope tied around the whole thing he just grabs the rope and pulls the whole platform just by himself (laughs) and moves it five feet over to where he wanted it so yeah he was he was very powerful and as far as uh, the danger of what he was doing. Yeah, there was a lot of danger. And to my recollection, he never injured himself badly. He always had black and blue marks and you know, a black fingernail here and there. But I don't remember him ever burning himself or dropping huge heavy things on his foot or anything like that. He was very efficient with his work and very safe, but he wasn't a scaredy cat. He would plow right in there and do whatever needed doing and if there was a risky task that had to be completed harry would normally do it himself as opposed to asking his workers to do it because he wanted to take the responsibility and not put them in danger so yeah well tell me grace grace is one of our student interns from utah tech university she's here for the fall semester uh tell me one important thing that you've learned from harry bertoya's career that you'll be able to take with you into your career oh there's a lot honestly i think harry bertoya he his perspective of his artwork and life itself is very unique and refreshing and like you had mentioned before his love of nature and translating that into his art is something that i've never really thought about I've, i've definitely taken that away the most because now i just kind of sit outside and think to myself kind of put myself in harry's shoes and um notice the the patterns in the trees and how connected everything is so that for me was again very inspiring and something I could take with me for a long time and another thing was just how resilient and much of a hard worker he was because I've heard Celia speak many times about how devoted he was to his artwork and that's something that I hope to continue to do and even um, as he aged he was still he was like a freight train. <laughs> Nothing can stop him. So I think I, I love that about him too. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah. You can always find out more at harrybertoya.org.